Story time here on the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. I always say I love a good story because with a good story comes the seed for somebody else to transform, revolutionize, improve their health. And today's guest is somebody who can certainly help plant that seed for so many people. Her story is second to none when it comes to inspiration. The fact that she had her own radical health transformation is only amplified by the fact that she herself is a doctor. She is also the producer and co-creator of the documentary Code Blue and the author of the brand new book, What's Missing from Medicine. And with that, we welcome Dr. Sarai Stancic to the exam room. Thank you so very much for being here. Thank you so much, Chuck. It's such a great pleasure to be joining you this afternoon. I have wanted to have you on the show for so long, and I am so glad that you're here. And I feel like we have vibrant colors that are just popping off of the screen, and that's going to get people in a good mood and ready to listen. Absolutely. I love it. Um, for those of our viewers and our listeners who aren't yet familiar with your story, uh, as I said at the top, it is one of the most inspirational tales that I have ever heard. Um, and it is a story that I, I would love for you to kind of walk us through. And I begin, uh, I believe that it begins all the way back on October 11th, 1995. What happened that day? Absolutely. You're on point. So I was a third year medical resident on call, um, thinking that everything was just fine. And it was a really busy night. And it wasn't until sometime in the mid-morning hours where I finally had an opportunity to take a nap. And I remember getting to that call room and falling asleep right away. I was so exhausted. About a half an hour later, I was paged to address another urgent matter. And when I tried to get up out of that sleeping position, I couldn't feel my legs. So it was that acute. Um, I was brought to the emergency room and an MRI was done that confirmed a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis with multiple lesions in both my brain and spinal cord. And so just like that, I went from this young, vibrant, healthy physician, at least I thought I was, to a chronic illness patient admitted to the hospital with multiple sclerosis. Had you had any symptoms before that? Or was this, I mean, completely out of left field? It felt like completely out of left field, Chuck. But, you know, in retrospect, when I look back, I would read, I would think um, at times I had some tingling in my toes or I felt really, really tired. But again, you know, I, I, I just assumed it was related to the fact that I was a, a medical resident with little sleep. I was, you know, eating out of, of vending machines. You can imagine what, what it's like to be a medical resident. Um, I was on call every, every third night. So the lifestyle of a medical resident isn't actually very healthy as you might imagine. So I just um, assumed that it was just wear and tear from, from my lifestyle. And so I never really paid much attention to it until abruptly it all came to a head on that evening. So the emotions that come with that, everything changes for you on a dime. You're still young. Your career is not even taking off just yet. I mean, you still have your whole life ahead of you and you're handed this diagnosis I mean, how are you feeling? Take the doctor standpoint out of it, right? Just how are you feeling as the person who was just diagnosed with this? You you just feel like somebody just kicked you in the gut and it's the last thing that, that you imagine is going to happen. I did all the right things. And, you know, I had finally arrived at my dream to become a physician. And now all of a sudden it was being taken away from me. So there was anger, there was loss, there was sadness. Uh, and then it was further, um, you know, the injury was even, uh, was, was even more difficult when the physician, the neurologist came to see me at the bedside and having had reviewed my MRI said to me, you have significant damage here. And the expectation is, and you need to be ready for this, that you will likely be in a wheelchair within 10 to 20 years. And um, at age 28, I had just turned 28 years old. Uh, this was uh, in, an incredibly difficult moment for me. 20, yeah, I mean, that's, oh boy. Um... So when you say that you were diagnosed with lesions on your brain and on your spine, can you define for us what that lesion actually is? A lot of us are thinking basically maybe a lesion you would get on the skin. Is it the same thing? So multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease and it damages myelin, which is this fatty sheath that protects the brain and spinal cord. And so the immune system actually attacks that and pops pops holes in it, essentially. And that uh, results in neurological symptomatology. And as the disease progresses, patients can, for example, uh, develop 
a, a disabling event where they now become dependent on a cane or or even a wheelchair. So what was the course of action that you took? What were the prescriptions you were given? What was the plan of action that was put into place? So, I, so at the time, I was actually told it was, it, it, I was lucky because the FDA had just approved the first medication indicated for, to slow the progression of multiple sclerosis. Uh, uh, it's called a disease modifying therapy. And that one was called beta seron. And it was a drug that I had to inject every day. Uh, and it, the idea was that it would slow the progression. It's not a cure, but it slows the progression. The problem with that was that this injectable drug um, has a significant side effect profile. So I would inject the drug at 10 o'clock at night, and then um, by the time, by two o'clock in the morning, I would wake up with fever, chills, muscle aches, pains, nausea, vomiting. I mean, it was just, this was happening to me every single day. And at some point, it just became so difficult that I didn't think I could do it much longer. So I I, I turned uh, to my neurologist to, to help him understand how difficult this regimen was. But he, he said to me, you have to continue going because this is your best chance at slowing the progression. And again, he reminded me of that wheelchair. Uh, so I felt compelled to continue on. And I did so um, for almost eight years. And what happened was not only was I taking that medication, but I was taking other medications uh, and I found myself within eight years of the diagnosis taking about a dozen medications in total. And despite all of those medications, my disease progressed and my quality of life suffered immensely. Uh, in 2003, I was largely dependent on a cane or set of crutches, and I began to lose hope. And how did this affect your career path? I would imagine it would be very difficult for you to maintain residency at a hospital, given the fact that you've had this diagnosis. Did you have to kind of pivot and go in another direction with your career? Well, I went on to complete a fellowship in infectious diseases. That was my passion. And I continued to practice medicine. It was it was challenging for sure. Uh, but I continued. Uh, for example, I'd have to get to work a little bit early in order to get to my office because, it, you know, I think things that we take for granted, uh, if you have, if you're dependent on a cane or, or crutches, uh, carving in additional time for doing that, but also uh, finding uh, opportunities uh, to gain support from 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 my team members. So I was always uh, very fortunate in that I had team members that were supporting me throughout the course of my career. Now, at any point, did you ask uh, your neurologist because the side effects were so severe? And at this point, you're being given pills to cover for side effects. And, and you said you were up to a dozen or so medications a day. Were you asking for alternatives at that point? What were you told? I wasn't. Uh, Chuck, I, I, you know, that wasn't a world that was familiar to me. I was a, board, a dual board certified physician in internal medicine and infectious diseases. And this idea of uh, I don't even call it alternative, this idea of lifestyle medicine um, being potentially a vehicle by which we could not only prevent disease, but also better um, manage disease and even potentially reverse it. That was foreign to me. And so the idea of that came to be in an unusual way. Um, in 2003, at this point, I was chief of infectious diseases at the VA in New York. And by chance, I came across a publication that discussed a connection between multiple sclerosis and diet. Uh, and I was struck by this. Again, dual board certified physician, I didn't know anything about nutrition uh, and how it affected risk of disease and, and, and outcomes in disease. So this was the that what I called the aha, the big aha moment for me, where I first connected this idea of how diet and how our food choices could potentially uh, affect um, you know, the disease formation. And as I read uh, the literature, because this small study really catalyzed this uh, insatiable appetite to learn as much as I could about this, um, I just uncovered all of this data that clearly connected uh, diet uh, with the disease state potentially. And there was a particular physician named Roy Swang who published an article in 1952 in the New England Journal of Medicine who described a hypothesis that he felt saturated fat consumption was playing a role uh, in multiple sclerosis. And I was struck by this. He not only hypothesized, he went on to actually treat a group of MS patients, 140 plus patients with a low fat plant-based diet over 34 years. And he 
reported in The Lancet in 1990 that 95% of his patients remained disability free. That was an incredibly exciting publication for me and it certainly uh, opened my eyes to the possibility of this being a potentially effective approach for me. Absolutely. So here's my question to you. If his first study was put out in 1952, yes. and then the, the follow-up to that, what, 38 years later in 1990, still well before your diagnosis, why then wasn't that brought up in the conversation between you and your doctors? Well, Dr. Swank didn't have a control uh, group in, in that evaluation of diet in, in that treatment regimen. Uh, and to, you know, it, it just, it wasn't the idea of diet, even today, Chuck, even though we have a lot of evidence to, to support that diet is playing a role, not only in MS, but in many autoimmune diseases, um, it's still not yet uh, accepted uh, as a valuable intervention um, in, in medicine and in, in, and in multiple sclerosis. And that, of course, I think is starting to change. I think a lot of uh, MS experts are looking at this more closely. There's been some recent uh, data published in the past couple of years looking at how diet affects the makeup of the microbiome. And in turn, the microbiome um, uh, is producing these signals like these small chain fatty acids like but butyrate that are then affecting the immune response. So I think that um, things are changing and uh, we're more and more evidence is piling up and speaking to the importance of diet and, and lifestyle altogether. You know, back in the 1990s when I was first diagnosed, um, I was advised not to exercise. Uh, and it was falsely believed that exercise exacerbated the disease. We know better today. We know that exercise is an important component in better managing multiple sclerosis. So I think that the evidence is, is moving us in the right direction, but we still have a lot of work to do. With that said, uh, the the options available to us in that disease modifying therapy category have expanded quite quite extensively since I was diagnosed. The, as I said to you earlier, uh, in 1995, the first drug was approved. I think we have now more than a dozen uh, medications that are available to patients with multiple who are newly diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And it's not that I'm against uh, the initiation of disease modifying therapies. There, there is efficacy associated with them. My concern is that um, in large part, uh, diet and exercise and all the other aspects of lifestyle are largely uh, completely ignored and they should be addressed with all patients, not, and again, all patients, but in multiple sclerosis, we know, for example, excess weight worsens outcomes. We know smoking worsens outcomes with MS, and yet uh, they're not addressed by um, multiple sclerosis experts. And I hope in the future that they will be, because it is an important part of assuring that patients reduce um, the risk of, of disabling events and improve the quality of their lives. So I want to go back to before 2003, before that aha moment. I'm assuming that doctors pretty much told you to eat whatever it was that you wanted. Would I be correct in that assumption? You would be correct. Yeah. So so give us an example of what your diet was like before the aha moment. I mean, I think it was uh, regrettably typically standard American diet. Um, I was probably, I was, you know, I, I never carried a lot of weight, but I was probably about 10 pounds heavier than I, than I should have been. Um, I mean, I was a young woman. I wasn't really uh, fixed on worrying about my cholesterol, my hemoglobin A1C. I certainly didn't have any of those um, comorbidities. Uh, and I was just very busy with, with my, uh, you know, practice. I was a practicing uh, physician. Um, a few years later, I was married. I had children. So you can imagine how my schedule was complicated. Uh, but on average, I would say was is more consistent with a standard American diet. I, I think that um, I did eat a good amount of, of plant sources, but I was by no means vegan. And so let's talk about when you decided to make that switch yourself over to a plant-based diet. You've had this aha moment. You kind of go down the rabbit hole and you're learning more and more and more. When you decided to make that switch for yourself, did you go all in or did you still approach it with a little bit of skepticism, even though you had just stacks of research in front of you? Yeah, well, I I would say I I, pre I pretty much went all in, um, but I but I 
I definitely can tell you that um, my diet has been more and more refined over the years. It didn't all change overnight. And some patients can do that. And I think that's extraordinary when they can do that. I wasn't that disciplined. Um, but I did, I would say I, I shifted my diet um, primarily. It was, it was certainly um, um, primarily plant-based. I would say about 90% of my diet was about uh, was plant-based. Um, and as I, I started to see improvement in, in my symptomatology over time, and, and it, again, it wasn't just my diet, it was also introducing exercise for the first time. In 2003, I could do very little without assistance with a cane or a crutch. So the only thing I could do was a stationary bike. And Chuck, when I first started on the bike, I could do no more than a couple of minutes and then exhausted and in pain, I would come off and it would take time to recover from that. Uh, in multiple sclerosis, when your body temperature goes up, there's something called Uthoff's phenomenon where your symptoms actually worsen during that time. And so that why that is why early on it was felt that you shouldn't exercise. So that was scary. So I would get onto this bike and then a couple of minutes later, my legs would feel numb and, and I would experience pain and numbness. But what I learned was that um, over time, as I would continue to return to the bike, I would do this every day. And I started to notice that I could go two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, it would expand over time. And those symptoms that I was once experiencing um, were no longer happening. So I started to build stamina and strength. Um, my diet changed, I, some of the weight came off. Um, I started to feel that veil of fatigue lift Fatigue is a very significant and the most common symptom that MS patients report. And all of a sudden I was free of that. And, and I often joke that I was able to stay up past Jeopardy for the first time. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that was to me a big win. So it was small steps. So I started to see um, my life was changing and it was moving in the right direction. And it was scary because in 2003, everyone told me, uh, this is a mistake to stop the disease modifying therapy. You're going, you're, you're, this is not a responsible decision that you've made. But for me, it was sort of weighing it, weighing out where I was going and the way I was feeling. My quality of life was so poor that it, I, I was willing to try anything. And so very early on, within six months of that, of those beginnings, I started to really um, feel empowered knowing that this decision was the right thing for me. Now, it wasn't perfect. I even had an ex another exacerbation about a year into, into the, the, um, the change in my life. But I knew despite that, that, I, that things were, were going in the right direction. And ultimately, I went from this young woman who was dependent on a cane or crutches and, and a dozen medications to one who crossed the finish line at a marathon in 2010, free of a medication. And, and today, Chuck, it's been 25 years since my diagnosis and I'm medication-free, disability-free and, and empowered more than ever before to share this healing message with whomever is willing to hear it because there's nothing special about me. We can all do this. It's just regrettably that we're not hearing these messages from our physicians and our healthcare professionals. It's not um, being spoken and it should be, it should be the primary uh, directive or advice that we're being offered by, by our healthcare professionals. And um, the good news is that we have many that are speaking to it and that are sharing this healing message with, with folks across the country and beyond. I think we're moving in the right direction. This idea of lifestyle medicine and plant-based nutrition is spreading across the country. There's an infectious quality to it because when we engage in it, we feel well. And when we feel well, uh, people want to know, what are you doing? Uh, how did you arrive at this? And, and we can share this message. We can share this message as neighbors or as physicians or as um, uh, just anyone can, can speak to this. But how wonderful and refreshing if we go to our physician and not only do they talk about us, talk to us about um, pharmaceutical inter uh, interventions, but what if they were to also talk to us about the power that lies in our personal choices? Um, help us to understand that by improving our, our choices, our dietary choices, ma maintaining physical activity, not smoking, and keeping a healthy weight, that if we did that, we could prevent 80% of chronic diseases. That would be amazing. Um, think of all the 
pain and suffering that we could avoid and the improvement of quality of life. And we want all people to optimize their existence. We want all people to live to their uh, greatest potential. And at the end of the day, at age 102 or whatever, 98, on that last day, that we share a beautiful day, a beautiful meal with our family and friends, clear of mind. And then we go to bed and we pass away peacefully with dignity. Uh, we know how to do that. We need to share this message with whomever is willing to hear it. And your story certainly lends itself to getting people to open their ears and to listen. Um, I, I want to get back to what it was you were talking about there, but you know, your story is so powerful. And I feel like over the last couple of minutes, you just hit the fast forward over so many good parts, right? Um, so I, I got to ask you, like, so your journey is made up of a series of incredible moments that helped to fill this well of hope that had run dry. And so you, you, you threw it out there so matter of factly, like you were eventually able to go to work without using the cane. I would love to know what that first day was like when you were able to leave the cane in the car and just go into the building, go into I the office. I remember that day so well. Um, it, it was incredible. It really was. It, it was about two years into my changes. And I remember distinctly that day. It was, a, it was the spring. It was a beautiful, sunny day. And as I would you know, routinely, you know, get out of the car and then turn to the back seat to pull the cane out. And I remember just stopping and saying, you know what? I feel pretty good. I don't think I need this. And then just powering forward and walking into the clinic and, and noticing uh, my team members, uh, everyone just, uh, it was just, there was like this silence. Um, and I remember that my nurse came, my, my nurse Eugene came up to me and just gave me a big hug. And he said, I'm so happy to see this. And it was, it really was a beautiful day. And, and then it just continuously got better and I got stronger and stronger. And again, to the point that um, I started to run and, and then the idea of signing up for a marathon was that seed was planted and uh, I remember at first when I, when I first heard the words, you should run a marathon, uh, thinking, wow, that's crazy. MS patients don't run marathons. That's so far out. Uh, and then I started to realize I needed to drop that label. You know, I was living my life as this woman with multiple sclerosis, this doctor with multiple sclerosis, this mother with multiple sclerosis, and I needed to drop that label. And that was freeing as well. Um, shedding uh, these perceptions of who I thought I I could be, uh, and then just empowering myself to push the envelope. And um, and that day when I crossed the finish line at the marathon, it was just and to have my husband and my my children, they were little at the time, there to greet me at the end. It was just uh, one of the most beautiful moments in my life. No doubt about it. And I heard at one of your lectures about another beautiful moment that I think that especially the women who are listening to this right now can really identify with. Uh, July 2nd, 2005, you were at a wedding. What yeah. happened? Right. I was invited to a wedding and uh, I did two things on that day, Chuck, that um, seemed trivial, but to me meant a lot because I hadn't been able to do it in a long time. I wore heels and I dance with my husband. Little things that so many people take for granted, just to be able to dance with their significant other at an event. Uh, mm -hmm. And if, if, you know, if you wear heels, just to be able to put those on, yeah. I mean, it's so simple, but again, you must've just felt like you were on top of the world that day. I did. I did. I mean, I, it, it was because envision this. I mean, for years, I hadn't been able to do that, right? So uh, the, diagnos the diagnosis came in 1995. That was 2005. It was 10 years of a lot, a lot of pain and suffering and not knowing, uh, you know, multiple sclerosis is a disease that hits you like a ton of bricks. Some days you have good days and other days you wake up and you're missing, you can't feel a leg, you can't pick up an arm, you can't, you go, I actually had a period where I lost my vision uh, and so this 
constant sense of fear. I would wake up in the morning, like check parts, you know, what am I feeling things can, it, it got to that point. It was just very scary. Um, waking up in the middle of the night with, with, with pain that would, I would jump out of the bed um, with these spasms that, that were just uh, hard to, hard to describe. Um, so many years of that. And then to, to see how uh, all of those uh, periods of difficulty just started to melt away and, and I could feel myself becoming more and more empowered um, and, and feeling like anything was possible. And, and that was in incredibly exciting for me. Uh, yeah, I think I can sum that up uh, just by saying you got your life back. And that's, that's the coolest thing ever. And so many people in life, I think they look back and they wish, they wish, man, I wish I could have done that differently. Right. But in your case, you actually did get a do over in a lot of ways and you're making the most out of it, which is just absolutely, uh, just incredibly, just so, so cool. Did you get an opportunity to speak with your original team of doctors who uh, you had been working with when you were first given the MS diagnosis? I, I did visit with him a few years ago, and he was very happy to see me. Uh, but the first question he asked me, what do you think was the first question he asked me? What have you been doing? What have you been eating? Are you still taking your medication? There are three guesses. Give me a one and three shot here. <laughs> what medication are you on? There you go. There yeah, you go. Of course. Yeah. He just assumed that the reason I was doing so well was because I was taking a medication. And when I told him I wasn't taking any medication, that I was eating a plant-based diet, and I had this really great lifestyle. Of course, um, he didn't really like that response. <laughs> you know, did, um, did you get an opportunity to continue that discussion? I mean, like maybe help him understand a little bit more, or is it just like any change that anybody makes, you have to be ready to listen and make that change for yourself and receive that information? I did. I, I mean, I really tried. Uh, we, we did have a conversation and he said, it's funny, my, my son, he actually told me his son was vegan and plant based and he didn't really understand it. So I, I tried to, you know, he was he's an older gentleman and sort of in, stuck in his ways. Um, he's a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, but, you know, he just wasn't open to the idea. But I did offer uh, to have a little more dialogue with him. And, and he was he was generous in that we did we did chat for a bit. You never know. Maybe on that day I planted a seed and unbeknownst to me, he's done a little bit of research and maybe he's opened up. I hope he has. Um, I think we're all capable of that. Maybe at the time we're not ready for the message, but isn't it wonderful when we can plant a seed and hopefully maybe on some day he can look it into it, look into it himself, just like anyone can. I mean, it's it, the, the data, the overwhelming body of evidence is out there for anyone to read it. They just have to search for it. It's oh, there. Oh, yeah. Those seeds, they can get tucked away for a rainy day. And before they long, that, that's, that rain causes that seed to sprout a little bit, and then you're, you're off and running. Um, I, I, I'm curious, did anybody else in your family have MS? Is this a genetic uh, disease? Yeah, good question. So, um no one in my family had uh, MS. The etiology or the cause of, uh, of MS is not clear yet. Uh, we, we're not really sure. Um, there may be some genetic influences, but it's not fully characterized yet. All right, let's switch gears here. I want to ask you about, um, you, you said that about 80% of these chronic illnesses could oh. be prevented. And it wasn't long ago that I had somebody on Instagram send me a message and say, well, hey, I've heard this 80% figure thrown out a lot recently. Where is that being based off? Where are those facts coming from? So could you, you know, help us understand that one? I'll give you one of one study that is often quoted um, is the Potsdam study. There's a large observational study conducted in Potsdam, Germany. 23,000 Germans were involved in that study. And they looked at four healthy lifestyle behaviors. Uh, which were eating a primarily plant-based diet, so lots of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, uh, not smoking. Obviously, smoking is the worst habit you can engage in. Exercising about 30 minutes every day and maintaining a healthy weight. And what they found was in those individuals that practiced those four healthy lifestyle behaviors, 80% of chronic diseases were prevented, which is, again, um, just an, a very special number. And And I think... 
regrettably, that's that's the type of study that all medical students, for example, should be aware of. And I, you know, it's not something that is currently being uh, taught in medical schools. The power of prevention is something that um, we pay little attention to. But in any, and even in that study, when you look at the details behind the 80 percent, 93 percent of diabetes was preventable, which is a Again, if you look at what's happening today in in our country, when I was in medical school, just to give you a little bit of perspective, rates of diabetes in this country about 2%. Today, we're brushing past 10%. And the CDC predicts that by 2050, 30% of Americans will be living with diabetes. Yet we have data, we have evidence in the literature that tells us today how to prevent 93% of diabetes. And yet it isn't something that is effectively conveyed through not not only to the public but in in medical school um, we're not we're not teaching medical students about the power that lies in, in, in these preventive approaches you think 93 percent of how many millions of people are diagnosed with diabetes every year how many more are already living with it I mean that is an enormous sum of people it is it is and and it's it's a it's a powerful prescriptive um, and it, it really does need to be conveyed to the to the American public. And so when you think prevention here, uh, I, I just equate lifestyle medicine so much with that. The six pillars in lifestyle medicine, healthy eating, physical activity, manage stress, uh, form and maintain relationships, uh, improve your sleep, and certainly don't smoke. Of those six, do they all carry equal weight or are some more important than others? That's a great question. You know, in, in my book, I use the analogy of a wheel with spokes. So I know some people refer to them as pillars. I like to use the spokes because it gives you that understanding that they are interconnected and they're sort of reliant on one another. I say that because some of us may be very good at our food and then maybe we're not very active or we're very good at our food and we're super active, but we're not sleeping effectively and maybe we're drinking too much. So it's important for us in order to achieve our best um, self and, and to reduce the risk of developing chronic disease and again, aging gracefully, we want to pay attention to every spoke on that wheel. Now, some spokes are easier for us than others. Um, as I said, some of us are really good at exercise and, and maybe we're not so good at sleep. So it's important to optimize those that you're really good at, but also to pay attention to and begin to exercise uh, those and, and improve upon those that you're you're a little bit weak on. So these chronic illnesses that we were talking about, the 80% that are preventable, I feel like over the last 18 months since the beginning of the pandemic, there has been a big bright light shown on them because very early on, we started to hear about the term comorbidities. And that was the first time so many of us were introduced to that. And those comorbidities are, in fact, these very chronic diseases that we have been talking about. So my question to you, as somebody who used to study and work with infectious diseases, is if more doctors were practicing lifestyle medicine and really zeroed in on prevention, how much differently may this pandemic have played out? Very likely much differently. We Very early on in, in June of last year, we learned um, how this chronic disease epidemic, the background of this chronic disease epidemic in which we exist in our country, how it, this pandemic uh, was affected. The CDC put out a morbidity and mortality report reporting that if you had a chronic disease at the time that you were infected with SARS-CoV-2, you were six times more likely to be hospitalized and 12 times more likely to die. So I, again, those, those numbers are really quite sobering. So think about that. We are a very, very sick country. This is the backdrop. And now on, to on top of this, we have this acute infectious contagion that just wreaked havoc because of these predispositions that we, we that are so common in our country. One in every two of us is living with at least a, a one chronic disease. In our country, 70% um, of us are either obese or overweight. That means in, in our country, to be normal weight, you're in a minority. The obesity epidemic is, is really quite frightening. It, it Just when you think we've plateaued and it can't get worse, it does. I'll give you an example, Chuck. When I started to write the book uh, in late 2020, I remember writing the section on obesity and I went to the CDC website to look at the obesity rate at the time. And at the time it was 39.8%. 
And I remember right before the book went to final print, uh, to, to print rather, I went to, you know, we were going through final edits and I went back to the CDC website to check that stat. And it was no longer 39.8, it was now 42.4. So in the span of about eight to nine months between the start of writing the book to ending the book, our obesity rate had climbed by 2.6%. Mm. It, and it continues to do so. We see uh, this, and you're familiar with the CDC's behavioral risk factor surveillance system, those obesity maps. And every year they worsen. We haven't had a year where things have either plateaued or have gotten better. It just can, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And where does it end? That's, uh, well, I tell you, for a lot of people where it ends is at the hospital. And so here's kind of what really boggles my mind and something that we've been working on here at the Physicians Committee, and I know that this is something near and dear to your heart as well, is the fact that you can go into still so many hospitals across the country, and what do you have right there? A Burger King, a McDonald's, a Taco Bell, all of these restaurants that are serving up the very foods that are driving this disease epidemic. Absolutely. Yes. And and talk to me about uh, one particular hospital that uh, you were working on. I believe it, was it in Oregon? They they had a Burger King in there. No, it actually was here in New Jersey at my medical school. So when I was a, a chief resident, uh, a Burger King came into our hospital, and at the time, uh, I thought it was insanity. How could you put a fast food restaurant within the four walls of our tertiary care center? And I can tell you. In Newark, New Jersey, this is an inner city where we're struggling with obesity and diabetes and heart disease. And so why would you put a Burger King inside of the hospital? Outside of the hospital, if you cross the street, there's a McDonald's and a Checkers and, you know, a, seri a, a Wendy's. There's a series of fast food restaurants. And um, I don't like that either. But what was most offensive to me was that it, w it was within the four walls of the hospital. And over the years, I have um, written to... Um, uh, you know, medical directors and politicians and whomever might do something about it. And uh, no one was really, no one really seemed to think that it was, it was a problem. Um, I, in 2015, I, I approached um, the C, the CEO there at University Hospital and regrettably it was unable to have a meeting to, to further discuss it. So I started to look at other avenues to bring attention to the Burger King. So we did, we did start a petition. We collected several thousand signatures. Um, I wanted to get a, a copy of the contract at Burger King because I was told that it was an evergreen contract that it would it could never end, which I thought was, was peculiar. So I did my best to try to get a con the copy of the contract and couldn't. Um, so I reached out to my good friend, Dr. Neil Barnard there at PCRM, and he supported the effort with the attorneys there at PCRM to finally get the contract. And what we learned was that, in fact, the Burger King uh, contract would have to be renewed every five years. And we knew that the next time for renewal was 2021. And so in a couple of summers ago, again, in an effort to bring attention to the Burger King, uh, Dr. Barnard and PCRM um, protested. We, we came together and we, we held a protest here in Newark, again, to bring attention. Uh, and the wonderful ending to this story is that uh, recently, University Hospital appointed a new um, CEO, Dr. Sharif Al-Nahal, who I think is um, wonderful and a courageous individual because he did this year um, and that contract and Burger King is no longer present in that hospital. And I had the wonderful opportunity of meeting him. I went to visit him a week ago to thank him personally uh, for being uh, the courageous leader that we needed. And um, it was wonderful to meet him. And he did tell me it was not an easy thing, that there were many obstacles, believe it or not, to removing a Burger King from a hospital setting. But I was glad that he was um, courageous and willing to put his neck on the line and do the right thing. And I am really just so thrilled that you were here today and uh, even more excited, the fact that you're going to be speaking at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine coming up in July. And if you go right now to pcrm.org slash ICNM and use the promo code exam room, all one word, you will save $50 off the cost of registration. And Dr. Stancic, I'm guessing you're going to go much more in depth than you and I did here today. Yes, I, I will. And I'm, I, looking, I'm very much looking forward to it. 
Uh, I, I'm looking forward to that as well. And I cannot recommend, there it is right there. I can't recommend your book enough. Uh, please everybody go ahead and pick that up. We're going to drop a link to uh, order it off of Amazon in the episode notes. Dr. Sarai Stancic, thank you so very much for everything and, and congratulations on your transformation and your comeback to health. I mean, just what a story. Thank you so much. So, so much fun talking to you today. If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.